I really like that talk too because it, you know, I can feel sort of there's a lot of people in the room so the, the, the idea of like making an awful lot of money like billions and billions of euros then people are like no 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 <laughs> nobody should make that kind of money <laughs> not me and definitely not you our ne our next speaker I'm I'm very excited also to bring up uh he uh he also uh, is a broadcaster and, uh, and a comedian. He co-presents The Infinite Monkey Cage with Professor Brian Cox, which I know for to be an actual fact because I listened to it. Uh, he also told me um, that his Wikipedia page was full of lies. This is double-blind study with, uh, with two people independently told me <laughs> that their Wikipedia pages were full of lies. So, let's see. Uh, born in 1960, no, 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 no. Uh, definitely does the infinite monkey cage. That is, that is a, a clever truth put in there to distract you from all the lies. English comedian, actor, and writer. Subjects include recreational drug use, politics, everyday life, women's gun undergarments from the 1930s, uh, science and religion. By the way, why did the... Uh, why did the Higgs boson not go to the cathedral on Thursday? Because there wasn't any mass. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry, that's just, come on, you, physics jokes, that was so forced. How did the photon say hello to the particle? It just waved. Okay, I'm really, really sorry. Somebody who does this much better than me, please welcome to the stage the fantastic Mr. Robin Ince. Well, they blew up a chicken man in Philly last night. Now they blew up his house. Hello. Uh, as we're doing physics jokes, old physics jokes, I'll tell you my favorite one then. Uh, this is one where uh, Heisenberg is speeding down the freeway and uh, a policeman pulls him over. He says, do you know how fast you were going? He says, no, but I know exactly where I am. So, <laughs> I should also, I have to start today by saying uh, that you've seen a lot of very wise uh, and, and smart people with real levels of expertise. I am not that. Uh, you've, you've seen people, they've really studied. I'm a kind of, well, basically, I'm a renaissance idiot. Um, I've, I've kind of read enough about a large enough number of subjects to be wrong about nearly everything. That's, I don't know if anyone else is like that. You kind of, you, you read just enough to, because some people are happy to remain ignorant. Some people will go, I don't know anything about that. Whereas I've reached that stage of being able to go, isn't it this? Oh, it's not, sorry, right? I just, <laughs> and I find myself constantly in, I, I'm very lucky, I genuinely feel, I, I find doing a show like this an absolute joy to, to be backstage talking to people, many of whom have, have genuinely suffered as well for what they believe in. And I, I am just this, you know, I, I used to just be normal stand-up comedy. And I, I then started to get more and more intrigued by philosophical ideas and scientific ideas. And that did change things as well. I spent 10 years playing kind of stand-up clubs where you get used to being heckled, you know, late at night and people are very drunk and they might heckle you. And then I moved into science kind of area and I found that there's not as much heckling. Instead, rather than heckling, you get footnotes. And it's, you're like halfway through routine and someone goes, can I stop you there? <laughs> I don't think you understand singularity at all, do you? <laughs> I don't, Professor, you're quite right. This is, I'm so excited to be in Magic Ash. But, uh, it is, and I, I, fit, this is what, I mean, I've, I've worked with Nobel Prize, I, mean, I say I've worked with Nobel Prize winners, I haven't worked with them, I've kind of, I've, I've been on the same stage, and I've, I had one where I, I was doing a, a British Science uh, Association event, and I, I'm, I'm so worried and, and nervous about seeing these people with incredible minds, minds that have, have changed our world and our perception of our world, and I was doing this one event in, in the UK in Birmingham, and there was this Nobel Prize winner there, and I was really kind of in awe of him. But I can tell you now, there are a few more delightful things to see in the world than a Nobel Prize winning scientist unable to work out how a taxi door works. <laughs> and just for once to have that edge of being able, and I let it play out for too long. I should have got involved immediately, but I thought, no. Just for a moment, I have the edge. <laughs> and then I just moved in and went, ah, yes, you've changed humanity, but look, I'm in here now, and I won't tell you who that was, uh, but it was Sir Paul Nurse. So, 
I thought I would start off by, well, I'm going to show you basically what, oh, what a horrifying, I've never seen my face in pencil and ink like that. That was horrifying. Um, I'm going to start off with this. This is what's basically bringing you the next 40 minutes. That is my brain. Uh, that is, I had a brain scan last year for fun, which is the best kind of scan to have. <laughs> if they give you a choice, go for the fun one, right? And uh, I, I met a guy on a train. My life is like this, right? I met a man on a train at about midnight. He walked up to me. His name was Peter. And he said, hello, I've heard your radio show. Would you like a brain scan? <laughs> yeah, which I thought was a lot ruder than this. <laughs> I've heard that. We should check, right? So, so, and I immediately said, yes. I said, that sounds brilliant. And he said, would you want to check out who I am? I said, not really. I think life's finite. Whatever happens, it will be an adventure. And, and that is genuinely how I feel. I, I thought, well, even if he's not in any way involved in neuroscience, I, you know, I'll end up in his back garden, kind of lying in a metal bin, with him just banging magnets around it, going, oh, yes, this really is an MRI. <laughs> then you can come and live in my love well. So as it was, I had an MRI, which was almost disappointing, but it was having imagined so, but it was, and also I love every time I show this, I have a real, the excitement of it is I'm always waiting for an expert to come up to me at the bar afterwards and go, hello, I'm afraid they missed something. Um, when does your tour end? October, that's lucky. And, but I love, if you ever get the chance, and maybe some of you have, to, if anyone offers you, and I've had a few since then, I've had three others since then for various different, because I just, the moment people find out you don't mind lying in an MRI, they say, come on in, right, it's great. And, uh, and seeing my, one of my favorite moments, actually, was that the woman who was actually doing the scan itself, Anita, um, at one point, apparently, when I was in there, she went, oh, my God, his brain's so big, I'm not sure I think I can fit it all in, <laughs> and then blushed. And very little about outside me has ever made a woman blush. The fact that my slightly larger occipital lobe had an effect, you know, and, and I should add, by the way, I'm not showing off, hey, I've got a bigger... It, it, the size of your brain within certain parameters doesn't, you know, change. It, it, it basically, Einstein had a smaller brain than me, but I still believe he had the intellectual edge, right? It's just... And so seeing this brain, seeing my... Well, there were a lot of thoughts. The first thing that came to me was the idea that... I, I started reading neuroscience in bits and pieces, I suppose, probably from my late teens. And you find out fascinating things. In fact, last year when I was touring, there was something that I found very interesting, which was uh, I, I was talking about the fact... You probably know about this. We only use 10% of our brain. You know, we, we only use 10% of our brain. Now, that, of course, turns out to be rubbish. We don't only use 10% of our brain. It's a myth which people can't seem to work out really where it came from. We don't only use 10% of our brain. But what is a delight when you're touring around doing shows with some science element in them is ideas change and new research comes along. So I happened to be doing a gig, uh, it was actually in Oslo. I was doing a gig in January and I was talking about the myth that we only use 10% of our brain. And a neuroscientist came up to me and she said, oh, it was interesting you were talking about that. That is predominantly true, but maybe you don't know this other fact. And she said, there's been some research recently, it's just been published in, in the magazine Nature. So what they found out is, it is true that most of us, you know, we don't only use 10% of our brain. But what they've discovered is that people who say, we only use 10% of our brain, do only use 10% of their brain. <laughs> but, but with that little bit of, as facetious as ever, right, nevertheless, there is still the other delight, is when you look at your own brain, when you see that brain there, the realisation that most of your brain doesn't even know you exist. Now, this is where I start to get very excited by the new discoveries we're making. Most of your brain is getting on with the humdrum nature of keeping you alive, of you surviving. And then in the frontal lobes, there lies the you of you and the meanness of me, right? But most of your brain doesn't even know you exist, right? We think, we, we are a puppet, but oh yes, I'm very much in charge. You know, I think that's going on. There is a delight to know that every single one of you, at some point today, there may well have been some of your brain that at one point went, no, not here, not in this shopping center. Did he do it? No, he didn't. Should we tell him? Never. Let's move on. <laughs> That's going on all the time. 
We have, and this is why, when anyone says that inside our skull we have the most complex thing in the known universe, the excitement of knowing that, the excitement of everything that people have been talking about today is, I think, a reminder of why we don't want to get caught up in dogma, why we want to use our own ability to think freely, why we don't want to let someone else's brain manipulate us. We have inside our brain the most complex thing in the known universe, inside our skull, Rav. And, uh, and when you see some of the things that, in the last 50 years, in the last 10 years, the abilities that we have, like, as I said, I get very nervous when I, I, I meet people with fabulous minds. I, uh, I met Peter Higgs last year. Peter Higgs, uh, of course, a, a great Nobel Prize winning scientist. Uh, the, the, and again, the beauty as well that we see with knowledge and that we see in particular, I think, with physics is that physics quite often requires delayed gratification. You come up with an idea, and it may take time. You know, Peter Higgs came up with an idea over 50 years ago. And some people went, that's a pretty good idea, Peter. That is a pretty good idea. Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to start digging underneath Switzerland, <laughs> and some of France as well. <laughs> and then when we've got something about 27 kilometers round, uh, we're going to create things which are currently almost beyond the human imagination. And then eventually, we're going to send round bundles of particles at speeds near that of light. I hope you're right. I mean, that's, that's a lot of... I mean, if, if suddenly six months later, and he goes, hang on a minute, that, they've started digging. So that's, but he waited 50 years, and if you've seen that footage of sitting in an auditorium where he saw the results that said, do you know what, Peter Higgs, over 50 years ago, you came up with a pretty good idea, right? And in fact, the, the time that I met him, I was up at the Edinburgh Science Festival, and a friend of mine said, would you like to go out for dinner with Peter Higgs? Like, I'm going to go, no, he's not on my list of Nobel Prize winning physicists I was hoping to meet, but thanks, right? So obviously I said yes, and then the moment I said yes, I thought, oh my God, what have I done? Why have I said yes? Do not say anything, right? Because I was very, and, and I started to have all of these little dreams. I had two days to wait, and I would have these little daydreams where I'd just be sitting and going, Peter, I've heard this about muons and gluons. <laughs> have you? Well, it's very wrong. <laughs> you must be an idiot. <laughs> yes, I am, Peter. I'm so sorry. I... <laughs> Why did Brian Cox tell me those things? <laughs> no one would believe I misled them. I'm so pretty. So. When you get to meet these, again, when you think about it, it's like some of the, uh, on this radio show, podcast I do, Infinite Monkey Cage, right? Again, we have these people who have incredible minds. We have, there was one of my favorite things we had actually recently was uh, we had uh, a woman called Lucy Cook who we were talking about uh, poison, toxicity, uh, what nature has created to uh, stymie other species who wish to eat creatures, right? And she, we were talking at one point, this was a beautiful story where she, as a child, had seen an image of, uh, I think I've got, let's see if I've got it here, let's see. Uh, there we go. That is, uh, sometimes it's called the golden poison frog. Uh, it goes under different kind of tree frog brace names. If you look up golden poison frog, you'll find that. It's a very small frog. It would fit pretty much on my hand at about that size there, right? Uh, it has on it, the poison is of such a strength that it could kill 10 human beings. Uh, if you do accidentally touch a, a golden uh, poison frog, you will die within about three minutes. The final minute, you will appear to be dead anyway, right? She had wanted to see one of these for the whole of her life. Finally, she goes to a rainforest. She's making a documentary. She is wearing special equipment. She's wearing special gloves. And it turns out they're not expecting this is going to happen, but she manages to handle a golden poison frog. She has wanted to see this since she was nine years old. She is looking at it in awe. She is looking at the beauty of nature, how mutation, heredity, and natural selection have led to this thing. She starts to weep. The frog leaps off. And as the tears run down her face with her hand, she goes to wipe. And the whole team went, no! And the finger was then, she went, oh, yes, I've just remembered now why it first started to fascinate me. And when I talked about it, I said, what a pity that happened, really, because you could have been famous for being killed by the beauty of nature. As it is, you'll probably just die of old age. And she went, well, in one way, you're right, but I'm quite happy with the scenario as it is. And so this level, when you see the passion, again, this, this, this is like, I'll show you, this is one of the guests we've had on. I don't know how aware you will be of this man uh, in, in Helsinki, but uh, this person here, that's a man called Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed is an actor uh, and an adventurer that we've had on. I'll give it, hopefully that picture gives you some idea. He's 78 years old. That's Brian Blessed. Uh, that's Brian Blessed. Uh, that's Brian Blessed. That's Brian Blessed. Uh, that's Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed is the kind of man how the power of his personality can make a screen fall. Merely 
only by seeing Brian Blessed, much of the equipment in this room in carry style will be destroyed by his projected telekinesis. Uh, Brian Blessed is... No one thinks it was you, it's fine. The, uh... He is right. I love his passion, right? We have had, as I said, we've had neuroscientists, we've had physicists, we've had biologists, we've had so many. But Brian Blessed at 78 years old, he is someone, you know, it's so easy now for us to be cynical. It's so easy for us to just kind of sit back and just allow television to waft over us, right? Brian Blessed at 78, when we first time on the show, right, he is, it was incredible. We were doing a show about intergalactic space travel. Brian Cox, Brian Blessed. Brian Cox turns to Brian Blessed, he says, Brian, how do you feel about intergalactic space travel? And 78-year-old Brian Blessed just went, I've always wanted to go to Mars! Why can't we go to Mars? Tell me, Brian, tell me, why aren't we on Mars? <laughs> he said, I don't know, I'm not really involved. He went, well, get involved, for fuck's sake! <laughs> That's the kind of man he is, right? After the gig, we're sitting there in the green room. He just suddenly turned to us. He's a bit tired. He's been shouting for two hours, right? We've had to try and get a half-hour programme without him swearing in it, which was tricky, right? Why can't I fly through the middle of Jupiter? It's a fucking gas planet. So, this tremendous energy, and he sits there, he's just drying his beard, and he turns to Brian and I just goes, Do you two ever go mountaineering? We went, no, we went, you should, you must but never camp below the French. Dirty bastards! They'll shit all over you. Let me explain. And he did. So, this is what I, I think we are inside every human being. If we tap into it, there is that similar amount of passion. There is that, uh, I think, like with physics, we've, we've had a physicist on already, right? When I, I as I said, I'm an idiot, right? I, I, I love the ideas of physics, but I know I'm never going to truly grasp them, but I'm having fun going on that ride, right? And I think that this idea of, like, we look back, for instance, to at the beginning of the 20th century, there's a beautiful thing that happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Lord Kelvin said, well, we've pretty much finished physics. We just need a couple more equations, just need to tighten them up a bit. That's physics done. <laughs> Turns out he was a little bit out on this one, right? <laughs> this beautiful counter-instinctual world that we get. We have this thing where what happened shortly after Lord Kelvin went, physics is done. So I was going to tell you what, Lord Kelvin, though, just before we close the book of physics, should we have a quick look at what things are like when they're really small? Well, they can if you want, but I don't imagine it'll change very much. Well, let's have a look. Ah! It's chaos! Look away! No, don't look away. It makes them do even more weird shit. Keep looking at them. Every time we turn away, they're up to stuff. This is beautiful. Suddenly, you end up in a universe of cheeky particles, of particles that appear to behave differently when unobserved. You can't help but anthropomorphize that world, that kind of, don't do anything unusual, they're still watching. That's it, just in a straight line, no interference pattern, nothing. They're still watching. They're, yeah, they're still watching. Don't do anything unusual. They've turned away. I'm everywhere! They're looking again. <laughs> That's so, this is where children get it wrong, right? Where, you know, when sometimes children, you, you hear them being naughty and you go upstairs and you go, what have you been doing? And they go, nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> wrong answer. What have you been doing? Everything. But now you're observing me, you've collapsed me into a state of good behavior. <laughs> Very well done, Archie. This is why, of course, also with science, it, is, it can be very, very confusing. It can, this is, there was a lovely thing, by the way, we were talking about this downstairs. We were talking about the ideas of science and the scientific method, and I quite often end up in arguments with people about ideas of science. I once had a huge argument with a journalist who, uh, he wrote to me and he said, if science is so good, why do they keep having to change it? And I just... <laughs> and I had to write back to him and explain. And I, and I said, well, well it, they keep on changing because science isn't about coming up with the absolute right answer, it's about coming up with the least wrong answer. It's about this journey that goes on that hopefully every decade, sometimes every year, every month at times, we are changing our view of the universe and with luck we're moving forward. Sometimes we go off and slightly in the wrong direction, but with luck we keep going forward and going a little less wrong, a little less wrong. But it's always about trying to come up with the least wrong answer. And he said, that's why science is rubbish. Scientists haven't even worked out how the universe began. Now, I think that's one of the bigger questions, right? In terms of questions I'm prepared to give scientists a bit of time on, I'm prepared to give them a bit of time on how come everything exists, right? <laughs> so I wrote back to him, I said, you're right, scientists haven't you know, discovered exactly how the, the universe began. They have got to roughly the first 10 to the minus 37 of a second, 
which isn't a bad star, is it, right? He went, exactly. That's why I don't trust scientists, and that's why my idea of how the universe began is as good. And it wasn't. And the reason is this idea that we have to is there are different levels of wrong. Some things are wrong. Some things are wrong. Some things are wrong, right? And once we start, this is like, if you, for instance, you go for a walk, and a wasp stings you, and one of your friends goes, oh, you've been stung by a wasp. Do you know what you need to do? You need to get a bit of yogurt and a small amount of brown sugar, and you dot the brown sugar around the sting, then you pop the yogurt in the middle, then you spin it round seven times like that, gets rid of the stingy feeling. And your other friend goes, no! You must cut your hand off immediately before the wasp demon goes into your mind. Both of those answers are wrong, right? But I feel that one is more wrong than the other, right? There is, it, once it gets to lopping off a limb, if you've got time, ask for a second opinion. You know, just, how did you lose your arms? It started with some jam. So, and this is like, when, when I was touring around America recently and going around, and we were looking for how easy it is to misconstrue people, to, to, to lead people in the wrong direction with, with science, because a lot of scientists, like this was one of my favorites. I was watching someone who, one of my favorite bits of kind of poor use of science. I mean, you know, like quite often people use the word quantum. Quantum comes up a lot to sell all manner of rubbish. It's a quantum hand lotion. You know, it's, it's a, this is, uh, it's quantum hand lotion. My skin's never been more alive and dead. And they, as long as I keep my gloves on, my skin in a super position. The, um, but it's, God, I just realized I've sit, now they've picked up the television. I realized how much time's passed. We haven't got as much time as I thought to deal with the entire universe. I might have to skip bits. So <laughs> this is, but this, this is my favorite bit of, of a kind of bad time. I was watching a lecture where someone was explaining homeopathy from the perspective of uh, 20th century physics. And I'll see if you can spot where I felt the scientific thinking went awry, right? I'm not a scientist, you might spot it earlier, right? So this person comes out and she says, uh, I'm going to explain homeopathy and I'm going to be using a few things here. I'm going to be, everyone here heard of Albert Einstein? You know Albert Einstein? Great, okay. And, uh, and also I'm going to be talking a little bit about physics. You want to, we're going to talk about some physics, you know, you know about physics. And water, you know water, okay? As if one of them's going to go, I don't know water. <laughs> I'm sentient dust. Anyway, right, so it goes, so, so you know water. Okay, now, Albert Einstein wrote an equation, and it turns out there was more than one, right? Um, let's not get bogged down now. Albert Einstein wrote an equation, and that equation was E equals mc squared. Now, do you know how much mass you are? Because E there is energy, m is mass, and the C there is for the speed of light. Do you know how much mass you are? Do you know how much mass you are? Well, do you know, if you took all the mass of the whole universe and you removed all the empty spaces, all of that mass would fit in something about the size of a basketball. So you are very little mass. So in a lot of ways, we can cross out the M of E equals MC squared. You can't, right? <laughs> Albert Einstein was a pretty clever guy. If he could have found a shortcut and gone, do you know what, lads? E equals C squared will do. He would have gone with that, right? This idea, and again, it's this misunderstanding of the idea that just because a number is small, it doesn't mean it's rubbish. If we have any physicists here, you will know there are some small numbers in physics. It doesn't mean the smaller the number, the worse the physicist, right? Planck's constant is not a big number. That doesn't mean Planck was rubbish. Oh, what a rubbish constant, Planck. It's like decimal point, 15 zeros, one six, whatever. What a rubbish physicist. Not like Avogadro's constant. He's got a great big constant. Well, I think Avogadro's compensating for something. Shut up, Plank! <laughs> oh, pi, pi, three point, yeah, 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 yeah. I just round it down to three. <laughs> A lot of my buildings are falling over. It's just... <laughs> and then there's another moment where, uh, after that, she goes, but that's not the end of the story. It wasn't even the beginning. She said, <laughs> said, then God gave us a new physicist, and, you're honest, yeah, and his name was Stephen Hawking's. Now, I don't have a problem with people sometimes mistaking Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, sometimes they have the S, you know, that can happen, that's a mistake that happens. But I believe that if a scientist is the central plank of your argument, you should have at least read their book to the end of the spine. <laughs> I think if you haven't gone that far, best just to stay back on the opinions. A brief hist is too hard. So, 
So this is where I kind of, going on to the, uh, like, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll quickly nip on because I've realized that I'm running out of time much earlier than I imagined. That's, that, that's Brian Blessed. The, uh, oh, I haven't world, got time to show, uh, this is, oh, uh, man. May be in. Right, I'm just going to show, this has got nothing to do with the lecture, right? I'm just going to show you this. Uh, this because I love the idea of, I meant to show you this in the first two minutes. I got distracted, sorry. The, um, this, uh, uh, right, this, don't, don't worry about this. Right, so, right this is uh, James Lovelock talking about robot uh, you standing. You may be interested to know that engineers who design robots never attempt to do anything as difficult never try to get as that. Standing. You can have robots with six legs that stand like tables, but you can't have ones that stand upright and walk and jump and dance. Let's have a look. Within ten years. That's real, by the way. That is a real robot. It's not a little man. Because it, it's moving in that way, you think, I'm not sure I trust that, right? And then, this is just, this is such a delight. This is a robot. This, by the way, I think has the most English movement through a room. Just watch this. It's just beautiful. So that is, this is, that's my brain again. So that, that is, the, right, this is where I want to get the brain. Right, so let's get back to the point, if there ever was one, which is, when, after I had the brain scan, right, which is, because also that was, that, I had three train journeys that were brilliant, right, I had three, I, I had the one where the guy said we want a brain scan, I then once had this man come up to me, uh, this was again about seven months ago, I was in, uh, I was going between Leeds and Manchester, and uh, very late at night, again about half past eleven, and this young man came up to me really sheepishly, and he went, hello, um, you probably want to be left alone. I went, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. He went, have you done a gig? I went, yeah, I was just, just doing a gig in Leeds. He, he said, oh, I'll leave. I said, no, join me if you want. He went, are you sure? I went, yes, yeah, fine. And he sat down and he went, oh, I've got a bit of a weird question for you. I went, just ask it. And he went, are you sure? I went, it's fine. He went, and he was really nervous. He was kind of blushing. And uh, I said, what is it? He said, I just wondered, would you like to come to the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability and have your EEG done? And I went, yeah, that sounds brilliant. Here's my email address. He said, do you want to check me out? I went, not really, it'll be an adventure, right? And he went, he went I thought it was going to be a lot harder than that. I went, no. Uh, he went, that must have been the weirdest question you've been asked all week. I went, not even in the top five. Because <laughs> it was Saturday. And because uh, on Monday, I'd been again leaving another gig, and I was sitting on a very small local line train after midnight, and this woman just came up to me, and she went, hello, I'm from Birmingham University Psychology Department. Can we do some tests on you? He said, what did you say? I said, yes, and I went there on Wednesday. It was good, right? So, this will get us back to, I went, and this is, this is where I become faster, again, in our brain and the way that we have to observe things, the way that we have to make sure that we stay as aware of ourselves, and like, this was Haley, who was the woman, Haley Drew, she was doing uh, an experiment, and what she wanted me to get involved with, many of you may know about this, the rubber hand illusion. Now, the rubber hand illusion is, uh, well, I'll run you through it, so I go into her office, and uh, go sit down, there's a kind of desk about that height, I suppose, maybe that height, and she wants me to put my left arm under the desk so I can't see my lower arm or the left hand. Then on top of the desk is a rubber hand, and it looks very much like a human hand. Now, all this test requires is for you to stare at the rubber hand. That's it, you just have to stare at the hand, nothing else. Now, one third of people, including me, within the space of one to two minutes, get a very strange sensation where you start to sense that hand. Your mind see, and it's not, it, you know that's not your hand, but you look and you go, that's a bit weird. Because <laughs> I can't feel the one down there, and I, I can, this is really weird. And you get a bit paranoid sometimes. You go, oh, it's, my hand feels a bit numb. It's like I can't move my fingers. <laughs> oh, yes, because it's a rubber hand, not connected to the rest of my body. That looks, well done, rational mind. You're doing well today. This is really good, right? <laughs> What it's doing is basically your mind is taking a shortcut. Very often our minds do. And it's just going, well, that's a hand. <laughs> it's probably yours. <laughs> and it's, it's absolutely brilliant, right? Then it gets better, right? Because that's just going to be one third of you. Up to about there, not necessarily that group. It may be mixed amongst you. It would be fantastic if it was like that. But... So one third of you will have that experience. Now the next bit will be 80% of you will experience this. The next thing Haley does is she gets out a little paintbrush and she starts brushing the rubber hand and my real hand, which I still can't see, in the same direction at the same time. 
Now, as I said, 80% of people within two minutes start to go, oh, now that is really mad. And it feels so authentically like, you can feel that, you can't feel that, you can feel that brush. You start to get quite possessive about it. In fact, sometimes you start preferring the rubber hand to your real hand. It's a better hand, it's a bigger hand, it's a real hand, not like my rubbishy old hand. They can't even work out that I'm actually feeling that one. All oh, right. And she just, and it's a, it's a beautiful moment of realizing about the kind of reality tunnel that we have, about the way that we put together our picture of the world that shortcuts are made, right? And there you are, and she's just, I don't know how many minutes this went on for. I went, this is really fantastic. When you're real, I said, it really, I'm getting the sensation as if I can feel it there. She went, it's good, isn't it? I went, yes, it is, right? And she's just stroking and stroking and stroking, and I am lost. I am mesmerized by this experience. And as I'm just looking at the stroking and stroking, suddenly, out of nowhere, she gets a hammer and goes, ah, and you go, ah! Oh, and she goes, ha ha! You really believed that was your hand, didn't you? Yes, I did! Why did you do that? I'm a psychologist. It's, it's really cool, right? And you can do this at home, by the way. You do, all you need, you don't need a rubber hand, right? You just, a, a glove. You don't even need a glove, but a glove is a good starting point. So, but, but you need a glove and a friend. That's what you need, right? And, and also work out your opening line. Don't just go, I've got a glove. Would you like to do an experiment? That all. <laughs> but that's all you need. And, and like, I knew all about the experiment beforehand. So it's, it doesn't matter how much you know. And, it's, uh, and what's fascinating, by the way, just a little sideline is, if you do the brushing in the opposite direction, so my real hand is being brushed that way, the rubber hand is being brushed that way, you will not get any sense of connection at all. The few people who do get a sense of that connection are the people who are more likely to report out-of-body experiences. So again, it is a little bit of a clue as to how much of our reality is occurring in there. This is all of the, so many different mystical experiences like the ones that are being talked about before. We're beginning to make this journey of understanding that. Now, if you don't have a glove, and or a friend. Here's another experiment you can do, right? This one is probably my favorite. All you need for this is a mirror, right? A mirror, preferably at head height, uh, which is probably the height you've gone for. It's very popular. <laughs> the knee mirror isn't catching on, right? The head mirror, right? All you need is a, like a bathroom mirror will do well. If you have a bathroom or you're in a hotel where you can kind of illuminate that area, but the rest of the bathroom can be dark. So what you need is a room where most of the surroundings are pretty much dark, but you can focus on your own head. Now, all you need to do for this is just stand in front of the mirror, look directly into your own eyes. And what, again, about 80% of you should experience after a minute or two is you will get the visual sensation that your head is changing. Some of you will get the sense that your head is kind of bubbling and pulsating. Some of you might get the sense that you suddenly look wretchedly old. I mean, really, really cronishly old. Some of you, your head will seem to disappear. <laughs> and what is happening is you are giving your mind so little input that eventually goes, nothing seems to be going on. <laughs> we better start making some shit up. And that's... And it's interesting, because having watched or talking about the holy astral, that which is, if you, there are some people who will sell you that as a mystical experience, right? I, I recently went on, on a, a, a kind of trek where someone said, oh, if you want to see the other creatures that live in the beyond, all you need to do is you need to sit for 15 minutes, you need to go in the lotus position, you need to place an eye in the middle of your head, and after 15 minutes, and I went, you just need a holiday in and one minute. That's all you need. And he went, but that's not the same. I went, well, but this is, again, this is kind of a key to the way that sometimes our real, our genuine experience Experience, which is not in any way mystical, can be turned mystical. It doesn't in any way, to me, lose the excitement of the first time you see your head bubbling. It's bloody brilliant, right? It's quite addictive as well, and very cheap. The, uh... <laughs> no, you've got the mirror in the wrong position. Try it like this instead of flat and covered in powder. So, um, <laughs> wrong direction, it's not that kind of gig. Anyway, so, so this is where, and uh, this is again where I kind of, the, the fascination of what is going on in our minds, what is going on uh, and how we're creating our world. Now, I wanted to move on to the fact that we as human beings, also the self-consciousness of human beings, about the fact that, um, well, I have a son, I mentioned him before, his name's Archie. Now, again, with the brain and the ideas of the brain, I am intrigued by how his brain has changed. He's now seven and a half years old. 
Uh, we, as human beings, have something which is rather wonderful, which was talked about by Charles Darwin, talked about by Jacob Ranowski, and many others, which is the idea of the long childhood. And this is, to, to give you a starting point, like anyone here with children will know that the moment you've actually had a child, one of the first experiences is, well, the changes you feel. Like, like for any women here who've been pregnant, uh, you will see that chemical change that happens where some of you might have found that in the final trimester when you were pregnant, you might have turned to your partner and out of nowhere suddenly gone, Keith, why haven't you turned that room into a nursery yet? You're driving me mad. Go and get the paint and buy a cot. Sometimes I think you're the worst decision I ever made. You can have it to different levels, right? And <laughs> that's the hormone prolactin kicking in. Prolactin is the nesting instinct, right? So that moment of rage is actually there, the hormone kicking in. And they've checked this out, by the way, by injecting prolactin directly into the brains of male rats. And what it makes the male rats do is it just makes them run around their cage and make loads of beds for no reason whatsoever, right? It's just... <laughs> Why are we doing this? I don't know, right? This is, it's actually, I, I was going to say, one of my favourite animal experiments. You're not meant to have a list, are you? But it's, uh, hang on, we're in Finland. Let's not worry about animal rights too much. So it's, uh, it is, uh, it's just like, in fact, one of my favourite, on the animal brain thing, right? This is, I, a friend of mine uh, looks after gorillas. Of course, that's the kind of friend I have, by the way. I have, uh, who do you want to hang around with? Wizards and gorilla keepers. And... Uh, and she told me this lovely story, again, where we see the different uh, ways that different animals kind of work. The, the male gorilla they got at London Zoo recently, it was actually just over a year ago, they got a new male gorilla. And often we would go out, Andrea and myself would go out to a pub and we'd talk about the different behaviours that she'd seen of the gorillas, because, of course, they're quite closely related to us. And this is my favourite one. They got this new male gorilla and she went, oh, we're having a bit of trouble with that one. He's, uh, he's pretty aggressive. He's, uh, I said, yes. she said, yeah, even by the standards of the other ones we've had, we're, it's very hard to judge his temperament at any point. I went, oh, that must be really difficult. She said, yeah, it is very difficult, but it's not, it's not the worst thing. I said, it's not the worst thing. I said, what's the worst thing? She said, the worst thing is, every time we go to clean out his bedding, we find new nuts and bolts, and we have no idea where they're coming from. And it's just, <laughs> she basically goes, nothing. And the... Uh, and because actually another, sorry, animal experiment, I'll try and look at the clock, I'm trying to get through as many animal experiments and then get onto the children thing, and then there's another point I want to make, right? But this is, do you remember, there's a little bit of a thing here going on, isn't there, with kind of uh, middle-aged male people doing the show tonight, isn't it? They get faster and faster, and they get tattier and tattier, and they don't really use an iron. Hello, Ben. Anyway, so <laughs> this is... This is, I loved, right, this, this is an experiment involving a bee, right? I love bees. I think, you know, bees now, they get a lot more published than they used to. They went out of the news in the 40s and 50s, but they're back in. Big news now, bees, right? Bees have part of the beauty of bees, again, part of the beauty of their evolution and the behavior within there. There is, is the waggle dance. You probably know about the waggle dance. The waggle dance is this, this wonderful thing where one bee uh, will leave the hive. It will find where the best pollen is. It will then return to the hive and do what we describe as a dance dance, and in that dance is the information which says to the other bees, this is the way to just go straight out of the hive, you go to the top of that road, turn left, you see an orchard, hop over the orchard, and you'll find loads of blossom, right? That's, that's basically the way it works. And hopefully, uh, one day, bees will also evolve to the point where the waggle dance doesn't just contain information, but can have gossip as well. I'd like the idea of just, <laughs> in a minute, I'll tell you where the best pollen is, but first, let me tell you what happened to me and a crane fly. Get on with it in a minute. Anyway, right, so <laughs> this, though, is a delightful experiment. They once gave a small amount of cocaine to a bee, and obviously a small amount. Don't overdo it. It's a bee, you know, so <laughs> they gave a bee a small amount of cocaine, and when it came back and did the waggle dance, it exaggerated how much pollen it had found. So <laughs> the fact that even bees are turned into vile narcissists by just... <laughs> Oh, there was loads of pollen. We went there, there was just a dead mushroom. Shut up. <laughs> I'm going to work in advertising. Anyway, right, so <laughs> this is... Actually, there's, there's another lovely one. I think I might have the slides for it. This is another of my favourite. There's a man called John C. Lilly, and I would highly recommend you read his work, right? He was, he was a little bit on the kind of outfield in terms of uh, ideas of neuroscience, right? But he did... I was watching this documentary with my wife a while ago, and uh, it was just... right. He did this experiment once, himself and, uh, and his assistant, Elizabeth Brown, I think it was. And um, the experiment was they wanted to teach a dolphin how to speak English, right? And it didn't work out, by the way, in case you were wondering, you'd heard about that, right? But they wanted to teach this dolphin how to speak English. And I was watching the documentary with my wife, right? So the first half hour, there's a woman just walking along with the dolphin going, hello. 
Hello. Oh, this right back and forth, paddle, paddle, paddle. So after 40 minutes, things haven't gone well, and then suddenly there's this wonderful bit, on the, just in the voiceover, it goes, at this point, they decided to give the dolphin some LSD. <laughs> My wife went, what on earth? They gave a dolphin LSD? Why did they give a dolphin LSD? I said it was the 1960s. Neuroscientists gave everything LSD. It was a brief window of funding opportunity, basically. Where we can get money. Money for what? Oh, I think so. Thank you very much. Uh, some for the sparrow, some for the blackbird, some for the reindeer, and a little bit for me. And everything's purple. So, and so he did these experiments. And, and what is wonderful in one way to see, and as I said, I recommend his books as well, because he's an interesting thinker, is you see this kind of arc amongst a lot of neuroscientists merely through their appearance. So if you see a picture of John C. Lilly in the 1950s, he just looks very straight-laced, kind of, hello, I'm John C. Lilly. I'm fascinated in the nature of the mind, the parietal, and the occipital lobe, and I hope to discover more about that. Then you cut to the early 70s. Now, not all straight-laced with a nice bow tie and neat hair. Now, weird beard, strange shirt, Davy Crockett hat. <laughs> then you cut to the late 90s, and his image then is just a man going, looking back, I might have wasted quite a lot of my time. <laughs> and <laughs> I'll just show you. I'm going to have to skip through these things that I was going to show you. Right, This is, hopefully, I've got John C. Lilly somewhere here. Where are we? This is uh, John C. Lilly in the 1950s. John C. Lilly in the 1970s. <laughs> John C. Lilly in the 1990s, right? So, so going back to, right, the long childhood, this is what I want, which is, uh, like, with my, with my son, with uh, seeing, like, the, the long childhood, again, like, the, like the pro, like, like that, if anyone here, when you first held, held a child, you know, when, when if, if, you, if you, I remember when my, my wife, uh, when, you know, when, when she gave birth to, to Archie, and everyone has said to me, when you first hold your child, they said, oh, by the way, everything changes, and you just, you, you won't be able to stop crying, you'll just, you'll just cry. And this is terrible. I didn't. When I was handed, my, my wife had to be taken away due to complications, I'm handed my son. My first reaction was, Oh, no, he's uglier than my sister's baby. <laughs> and the, a very competitive family. And, and then I looked again and went, oh, no, he's not, because hers came out with a bit of a pointy kind of... Anyway, right, so the, uh, hers came out as a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And the, um, so, so, this is, so I didn't cry when my son was born, and uh, it was actually much later on. It was that night I'd had to leave the hospital. Eventually, it's about midnight, and that moment when you've had a child and you realise that the chemicals inside you, the, the, the love, everything has changed, that moment that you go, I have an even looser grip on my emotions before, I found myself sitting at home. You know when you start crying and you don't even realise that you're crying, and then you look at what you're crying at and you go, how's that happened? That, I was sitting watching television. I said, well, I'm crying. Why? I was crying over an advert for butter. I, <laughs> it was set on a mountain. Uh, there were some cows. There was some lovely cello music, right? And I was suddenly, every, I'm like, I can't believe it's the most beautiful advert for butter I've ever seen. It's spreadable straight from the fridge. Oh, that Archie has been born in a world with butter like that when I was a child, the bread broke. <laughs> right? And this is, again, one of the fascinating things about the way that our brain has, well, with empathy, with oxytocin. Oxytocin is one of the things that kicks in, you know, at the point of birth. And this is, and this moment, when you realise how easily you can be manipulated, when you realise the way you can empathise with different people, when you realise about, like, you know when you're watching a movie, and there's a thing, have you ever heard of crying porn? Well, I better leave then. This is, um, <laughs> that'd be great just to leave. They go, have you ever heard of crying porn? Well, you haven't. I'm leaving Helsinki. What was he talking about? We better Google it. Oh, dear. The, uh, <laughs> my top searches seem to have changed, not for the better. The, uh, Crying, in the same, crying porn are things that you watch which will bring forth tears. You know, that thing which may well be... Anyway, but it's those things where you watch them and you sometimes have a feeling that you want to weep. Maybe you've been to an occasion where you felt you should have cried but you didn't cry. So, for instance, Pixar movies are very often crying porn. If you've seen any Pixar movies, if you've ever seen Up, if you've seen the film Up about the old man, the death of his wife, right, the first ten minutes of Pixar's Up, if, if you've ever sat with someone else and they haven't cried or been moved by it, don't you afterwards go... I don't really trust him as much as I used to. It's, kind of, it's like if they ever remake Blade Runner, that's the test they should use on replicants, I think, is any Pixar movie. Here's the final reel of Toy Story 3. It's very beautiful. I dreamt of a unicorn. Get out. So the, um, 
But so this is this incredible, like this bit where, like, I, oh, I haven't got, this is what worries me. Sometimes I watch films and I find myself crying and I think this is a remarkable thing. I'm watching some actors. I know they're actors. I know this isn't real. I know this is just a preposterous situation to be in. And I think this is a bizarre thing that films and music as well can be as potent as real life experience. And then I had this horrifying moment of thinking, actually, films might be more potent than real life because real life doesn't have an orchestra. And so it's just like <laughs> these moments where, so I'm really sorry, by the way, it's because the thing's flashing and I'm not halfway through. And so I'm trying to work out everything. And if I can work out an hour's worth of stuff and do it in three minutes, I might just do a load of different sounds and then you can re-edit them into sentences and just, but so the two stories that I'll tell, which is one was about watching my, because the long childhood, this is something which is so important. And uh, you know, for everyone here who is a parent and for everyone who is a child, which hopefully most of you are, except for some of us, we made by experiment, we'll reveal ourselves later. But, right, the, when most animals are, if you've, you know, you've, you've seen, when other animals are born, very many animals, for instance, have a point where they're almost free from the moment of hatching. They can be, there can be a level of freedom. The further up the tree of life we go, the longer, it seems, the relationship between parent and child, mother and child, etc. So, But even for something like a horse, if you see a, a foal being born, the foal, you know, it comes out, it's very sudden, eventually it kind of stands up and it wobbles around a bit and it might have a little moment where it moves away, but it goes back to its mother, but it already has a level of freedom. Whereas babies, they do nothing. It's ter that first moment that you hold a child and you go, is that it? Are they meant to be doing any more than that? And you, you're just like, I remember holding my son, it's five in the morning and thinking, shouldn't he be doing more? And every now and again going, jab, wiggle. <laughs> He's alive, that's good, right? So this is <laughs> jab, wiggle, life, right? And then I had that moment of suddenly realizing the important, the, the pressure I was under. Because, you know, a child is not a blank slate, but it is blankish. There is a lot of work to do between the, the nature and nurture. There is, you know, that moment of feeling of responsibility when I looked at my son and I thought, I have to make a child who is curious and empathetic and altruistic and just to all of the best features of what it can be to be human. And then you have that other moment, that moment of fear that when you look at your child and you suddenly think, oh my God, what's the one mistake I'm going to make that means he's going to turn out to be a mass murdering serial killer, right? There are these little moments where for those of you that, that might think, I'll just, uh, within three days, I remember just thinking, what will it be? And I flash forward to like 30 years time. I'm just there going, Archie, why did you kill, cook and eat all those 58 people? And they go, can't you remember, Father? Go, no, what goes? It was that day on the beach. Chesil Beach, I think it was. I was eating a lolly. There was a sudden gust of wind. The lolly fell into the shingle. And you shouted at me, even though it wasn't my fault. From that point onwards, I knew I'd kill. So it's like this. <laughs> That responsibility, this is, if this talks about one thing, it's the responsibility of all of us to make sure we don't have mass murdering, serial killing children. And, and then seeing, as I've watched his brain develop, as I've seen the emotional side, the self-conscious side, the side of, and the questioning side as well, that's one of the things that I love as well. I love that moment of seeing in his mind, there was a lovely thing when he was five, and that beginning of understanding of an anecdote, there was a point that he was in the bath, and, uh, and, he, just, and he suddenly shouts at me, he goes, Dad, I've just put my finger up my bottom. And there's all poo up there. I said, of course there is, Archie. That's where the poo is, isn't it? He went, oh, yeah. I'd forgotten, right? <laughs> I said, don't put your finger up there again, Archie. That's mainly an area of the body for things to come out from, right? Which even then, as a liberal parent, I thought, was that the right thing to say? Well, that, what's that? <laughs> Will that have Freudian ramifications or Jungian ramifications? I don't know, right? Then about four minutes later, he shouts again. He goes, Dad, I've just put my finger up my nose. I said, Archie, I hope that wasn't the same finger you put up your bottom. He said, of course not. I said, that's correct, Archie. One hand for putting up your nose, one hand for putting up your bottom, right? He then laughed and went, you should do that in one of your shows. <laughs> but don't say it was me, say it was mummy. <laughs> so that's... And then whenever I do talk about that, if, he's at, if he was at a festival once and he heard me do that, and he went, that bit went down well, as if to go, come on. And then... <laughs> Pay up, Dad, who's making this stuff? But this is, so the final thing I'll say, sorry, I have over, overrun, and uh, which is this bit of, of questioning. One of the things I mentioned before about really the main reason I was talking about the rubber hand illusion and stuff like that is 
all the time questioning why we believe what we believe, all the time, you know, realizing as well, there was a, one, one of the, the monkey cages that we did a long time ago, there was a wonderful statement where someone said, we cannot observe nature from outside of nature. We have to be aware of the fact that when we are observing nature, we may well have limitations, which Professor Brian Cox didn't like at all. He went, that's rubbish, right? He got really angry about it, right? But then afterwards, we kind of thought, yes, there may well be limitations. And to think about the reality tunnel we're in as well, the fact that we have to Often, as often as possible, when you see Twitter, when you see the way the news, when you see the culture you're in, go, why do I believe this? What is it in the way that I've been brought up? So this is the little story that I want to say that was when I was, this was last year, and I got home, I'd been away for about two weeks touring, and I walked in, it was midnight, and my wife went, oh, thank heavens you're home. I said, what's happened? She went, it's Archie, he's furious. I said, why, what's happened? She went, you know he's got wobbly teeth? I went, yeah. So obviously, last night, when he was asleep, one of his teeth fell out. I hadn't realized it had fallen out. I was tidying his bed this morning, and I thought I'd found a moldy old bit of popcorn. So I just threw it away. And then he got home from school, and he went, where's my tooth? I realized what had happened, and I was like, I explained, and then he got really upset, and he's, he's cross, and he said, oh, now the tooth fairy won't come, and I won't get any money, and I just don't know how I'm going to calm him down. I said, it's fine, we can sort this out. He said, how? I said, it's fine. So I wrote a letter from the tooth fairy's undersecretary, right? Very similar. Dear Archie Joseph Ince, it has come to our notice that a small tooth has been found in a drainage grate just outside your house. Could it perhaps be yours? We've heard your mother can sometimes be rather errant with your wobbliest teeth. If so, we'll be able to arrange some form of remuneration. Lots of love, Zaffo, the tooth fairy's undersecretary, right? <laughs> so he wakes up the next morning, he finds this under the pillow, he's going, uh, remu I said, remuneration. He said, what does that mean? I said, money. He said, good. He said, what do I have to do? I said, you now have to write a letter to the Tooth Fairy explaining the situation. He went, okay, so he writes this lovely letter. The next night when he's asleep, I write letter part two. He goes, dear Arch Joseph Ince, uh, we've now double checked and we're almost certain the tooth uh, in the drainage grate was yours. In fact, while you were asleep, we double checked, we popped it into your mouth, slid it in, slid it back out again, almost perfect fit. Because I thought I'd spook him just a little bit as well. Just <laughs> Please tell your mother to be more careful with your wobbliest teeth in future. Lots of love, the tooth fairy. And Archie woke up, and he found the letter, and he found two pounds, and he went, brilliant! But what a rigmarole. And it's just this, this idea that in his reality tunnel, you know, which is always changing, there's a little bit where he goes, do you know what, I'm not entirely sure about this tooth fairy narrative, but I like two pounds, so I'll go with it for the time being. <laughs> and this really is not the point that I was going to end the show on. Uh, show, that's exaggerated. I haven't even shown you my favourite... Oh, I've got to go there to see what else. I'll tell you what, I'm good. this now has no context whatsoever, unlike the rest of the carefully worked out narrative arc. And uh, this is... Uh, this is right, this is what I'm going to show. I, I meant to mention, because right at the beginning I wanted to talk about Richard Feynman, who's one of my favourite Nobel Prize winning physicists, one of my favourite physicists. I think a very fascinating individual and one of these people who his whole life was basically... If you know his work, he did incredible work in quantum electrodynamics, but he was fascinated in why the world was as it was, not just for the purpose of physics, just for the purpose of being excited to be in the world for a finite amount of time and go, I want to question everything. One of my favorite stories of his actually is once when he was still a very young man, he was a student, and it was the coldest day of the year, and uh, his roommate returned to their room, and the window was wide open, and the, the blizzard was blowing in, and Richard Feynman was just leaning out the window with an enormous bowl of jelly, which he was vigorously stirring, and his roommate went, what on earth are you doing? And he said, I just wondered, could jelly set if constantly stirred at sub-zero temperatures? And uh, he never published, we still don't know, so there's work to be done. And it's, uh, so in a strange way, I didn't get to the point, but I'm just going to end on showing the excitement that it was to be Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize, to show the humanity of this is the most important thing. We have so many abilities, and, you know, and, and science is not a separate thing. It's not just, hello, I'm a scientist. Scientists are human beings. I know it's a dangerous precedent to set, but they really are. I've met some, and they were fine. And, uh, and this is Richard Feynman. Uh, three days before he died, I think it was three, or it might be five days before he died, here see a Nobel Prize winning physicist playing the bongos. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, you know, I can't, 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 I